Hello everyone. Um, so, Catherine, there's my Twitter if you want to check me out on there. Um, I'm my senior designer at the Chinese Room. So, who am I? That's me. <laughs> this is a resemblance. Um, so, I've been working in the games industry as a designer since 2009. Um, I'm a senior designer, as I've just previously mentioned, at the Chinese Room. Prior to that, I was also at Creative Assembly, working on Halo Wars 2 and Alien Isolation. I remember before that EA as well, but I'll go more in depth on that in a bit. Um, I'm also on the BAFTA Games Committee, so BAFTA have a games committee that then has to do with the awards and everything that leads up to those, along with doing events in London um, and actually across the country as well uh, for people to go to to find out a little bit more about games than just what they see when they pick up a game. Um, I've worked on teams full of amazing people. Games are made by lots of people. Um, I mean, as Simon's just described, he's worked on teams of uh, various numbers, as have I. Um, alongside that, I like doing game jams, which is making game in a short space of time. Usually it'll be about two days, uh, so like over a weekend. Um, but I like to do those as well as make games professionally. Um, I love making games, and I love games. So that's like very game-centric. Uh, but I like other stuff too. So. Where did it all start? Um, I wanted to find a photo of me and my twin sister. So I believe this is my twin, Charlotte, and that's me down the bottom. At least from looking at it, it's kind of hard. It's an old photo. Um, but I wanted to find a photo of us playing games together. I didn't have any of those photos, so this was the best I could do. Um, we've, both of us, like as a collective, have played games since uh, we were very young. Um, games have always been like a thing that I really enjoyed. Um, so I have very fond memories of things like playing Virtual Fighter 2 until like maybe 2 a.m. in the morning, uh, like just two-player playing us uh, together, or Hours of Sonic, specifically that's the Master System version, or of course the Mega Drive version, which people are more used to. Um, other games as well, like Survival, which was on the Spectrum, if anyone might have even played that. It was quite an odd game to quite enjoy, but it was really hard. You were the little A, and you had to survive, and there were bad things and you had to you know, have water and energy. It was quite um, simplistic, but it was a survival game, so you could think maybe it inspired a lot of the games that we have these days. Um, other games that people might realize are things like GoldenEye. So whenever we had friends around, it'd be like, hey, you want to play GoldenEye, right? Because there were two of us at home, but we always wanted to do four-player. So we'd always try and encourage all of our friends to play games as well. Um, and also just a big shout out to demo discs. It's not really something that we get these days, but. Um, I played so much Resident Evil 2 from this demo, not from the game, until I finally could afford to get it. So basically, like, I've always loved games. They've always been a big key part of my life, but I never knew that there was a way that I could actually create games. As a, as a child, I thought, you know, games are like this distant thing that you don't get to see. Um, and it was like, there was a big barrier between it because naive young Catherine thought most games were made in Japan. Um, and I'd never get to do anything like that. And that they were all programmed as well, because there wasn't that much information. I didn't have the internet in 1992. I didn't have the internet for quite a while after that. But um, that information wasn't there, whereas I think the key thing is now is that that information is there, and the people are there, and they're approachable. And you can find out exactly like what happens in the games industry and have a go at doing it yourself. So how did I get into games? So I took a different route to Simon. I attended university. So I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was 15, 16, 17. I had no idea. Um, my twin was like looking at universities and she wanted to do film. And she'd seen that there were a few different universities that also did games courses. So I didn't realize this was a thing. Uh, we kind of looked into it and I was kind of like, you know what, yeah, I'll give that a go. So I attended the University of Wales uh, in Newport. It's sadly no longer there. Um, it's now in Cardiff, um, and this is the lovely Killeen campus. Beautiful Wales, lovely there. Um, so I graduated with a first. I, um, I really enjoyed the course. I think the good thing that university does is it teaches you how to work with people and how to communicate, which maybe you might not get that if you tried to go straight into games, um, but there are different routes that you can take. So after graduating in 2009, I moved to Aldershot. Um, which is kind of close to Guildford um, in Surrey, which was a games hub back in 2009. Um, after moving there for about a month, I got a job at EA Brightlight, which had this amazingly massive studio, kind of the things that you'd think would be in America, not in the city centre of Guildford. So it was a massive place. They made Harry Potter games, so we had like a massive Hogwarts kind of banner, 
and the giant cars from Criterion's games as well. And you can see like just their IP everywhere. So Bright Light was a really, really cool place to start my, um, my industry career. I was there for two years. Um, and I worked on a variety of games, which I'll show you on my next slide. But um, they were kind of known for doing, I suppose, more family-friendly games. Um, they did get shut down back in 2011, um, so just, just before I left. Um, but I got to do some amazing things there. So, like, I got to work three press events that we did, um, mainly for showing off Connect, which was quite interesting, uh, for Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1. Um, so I went to Munich for the Connect launch. That was really fun. The fact that they, they allowed me to go to it when I was still just a designer was really nice. Um, and then I also did a dev diary for Deathly Hallows Part 2, um, which was a really amazing game compared to the first game. And it's just really sad that not that many people played it because um, it doesn't really have a very good Metacritic. Um, but it's Gears of Potter, basically. So it's a third-person cover shooter in the Harry Potter universe. It's actually really not too bad, so if people want to play it, they should give it a play. Um, so yeah, what have I worked on? When I started at, um, at EA Brightlight, my first project wasn't the kind of, the thing that you'd think EA would make. So it was books for kids on the DS uh, with a slight added bit of interaction to them. Um, they did have a disclaimer on them, which you can kind of see here in its blurry sense, which was that they weren't rated. So there was no Peggy rating on them. So they were for all ages, uh, but that then meant we couldn't add much in the way of gameplay. So my role on the team was um, a design editor. So that's a job you're not going to find anywhere because that was like bespoke. I basically read kids' books for the six months I was the, um, working on this project um, and had to find things I thought would be interesting for a child to find in the books. So words they could click on and like a silly sound effect to play. Or if there's a mention in Too Ghoul for School, for example, of like splats or things that were like gross, have something appear on the screen like a little effect. Um, it kind of then went into more detail. Like my favorite one was Percy Jackson, uh, which of course is a fairly big kids um, series of books. Um, but I did like a beastery to it and like a family tree of the Greek gods. Uh, but I had to amend it a little bit because it's a little bit unkid friendly, I would say. Um, but yes, yeah, so that was like my first, my first role. It was kind of using things that I wouldn't think that I would use in the games industry. So it just kind of, it shows you that not everything's as you'd expect within games. Uh, because my role was basically within Excel and a PDF editor to be able to do this. After that, I then worked on these two Harry Potter games. As I said, uh, they were quite different. We had Connect support with the first one. Uh, the second one didn't have the Connect support, uh, but it was generally a much better game because we learned from our, our problems with the first game and then improved upon it. Um, that was quite a different role because then I was working within a level editor, which I would have thought that was what I would do when I start in the games industry. So EA used their own custom tools, um, and I was designing levels, adding sound, of, well, not sound effects, adding a VO from the script for the film, um, placing enemies, a variety of different things, placing cover. Um, and my role on that was an integrator. So integrator could be another term for level designer. I think it's usually an EA term. Um, but that, if you ever see a role called integrator, that's kind of what that would be. So I spent two years in total at EA. After that, I moved to Creative Assembly, where I worked on Alien Isolation. Love the Japanese box arts. So that's why I always show that. Um, but so that was, I'd say, more similar to working on the Harry Potter games. Not that they're anything like each other, but um, just in a, in a way of how I was working. So I was designing levels, coming up with mission scenarios, implementing things. I have some examples. Here's a level layout. So you can see lots of orange blobs. Those are markup for the AI. Um, the AI of the alien and everything else in the game was very fluid, and it would move around. It wasn't scripted like you might see in other games where you can see AI take a prescriptive path. The alien would kind of pick and choose where it would go, so we had to give it as much space as possible. But then it wasn't also just about that. It was about creating a space for the player to be able to move around in and not ever feel endangered. 
So I had to have various routes of like different vents you can go through, different doorways you can go through, basically creating sandbox gameplay loops um, to give you the best experience possible. And this is then the scripting side of things, just to give like a general idea. This is very messy script. If your script looks like this, you should tidy it up. Um, <laughs> but this is like this is basically like the so the first alien encounter. If anyone's played Alien Isolation um, within hospital. Uh, San Cristobal Medical Facility. Like, this is, like, basically the level and everything that occurs. A lot of it is, like, dialogue playing or opening things or allowing things to continue on. Um, very little to do with the alien. After that, I then worked on Halo Wars 2. Um, so that was, of course, more recently came out. That was quite a different role because it was more single-player and multiplayer maps. So I hadn't really done much in the way of multiplayer before. Um, and it was also scripting a, an RTS experience or a real-time strategy game, which is quite different to, um, you know, like a fluid AI moving through a world. Um, but that was super interesting. I then worked on that and then left about a year ago to work on, well, to work at a company that made this game and this game, if anyone recognizes these. So this is uh, Dear Esther and Everybody's Gone to the Rapture. Uh, which is uh, game is made by the Chinese room. So I started there back in June last year, um, and I've been working on a game oh, with these lovely people. Um, so you can see as well that we have a very diverse team, uh, which is quite good compared to like companies that I've been at in the past. Uh, we're amazing people, and we love making games. We're making a game called So Let Us Melt, uh, which is a game for Daydream, which is a VR platform, but a mobile VR platform. Um, we kind of haven't really announced a huge amount on it, so I have this lovely screenshot of kind of, it's a mixture of concept art and game art, um, and we've kind of announced a little bit about it on our blog, but otherwise there'll be more information coming soon. Um, but yeah, so Chinese Room's like an amazing place, you should keep an eye on them. We're like a small independent company, there's, hopefully I've not got this wrong, I think there's 11 of us. So it's a very small team compared to EA, which was at its most about 120, and... CA was about the same on the console team as well. So I want to do a quick little bit on what a designer does or what you might think they do. Does anyone, uh, other than of course the examples I've just given, does anyone like want to get into design or have a feeling they might like it or, yeah? One, cool, okay. So I have a great example which is like a little test here which is to get you in the mindset of games. So. I've kind of cut off a little bit at the bottom of this. So in this image, a designer could do various different things in this scenario. So based off things I've said before, like in the previous slide, so you might be controlling these ladies and the other people's their paths through the environment. You might also be setting up the level so you can see the, the line of sight of what your goal is. So maybe you want to get to this in the past. In the past? In the ahead. Um, then we've got these two um, sculptures, shrines here. Maybe they're enemies. Maybe you script them coming to life when the player walks through it. But then also maybe it's a traversal game. Maybe you have to, to mark up spaces where the player can get up here. Maybe they use that little bit of gate there or that telegraph pole or tree to climb up. And then maybe they have to come up here. But then if you were doing something like that, you need to make sure there was something to attract the player's attention. Because otherwise, you know, this just looks like a temple. It doesn't look like there's anything special to it. But there's a lot that a designer would do within this space and to make this space feel believable, which, of course, you know, a photograph will do because it's a photograph. But, yeah, so that's, like, a little example of what you could think about in that space. There are many other things as well. Um, I mean, other than that, a designer does lots and lots of different things. Um, everyone in the games industry does lots of meetings. That's just, like, a thing full stop. But... Um, I mean, we'll, we'll, you know, you can design characters, you can design the story, you can design levels, you can design mechanics. There's so much to it. So I just want to do a little brief little bit on my ambitions for the future. So short term, I said I like game jams. These are some of my lovely game jam games that I've made in the past with the uh, lovely imagery and funny names. Um, I believe at the moment I'm currently, I've done about 29 game jams. I want to hit 30. But that's not a very like long term, what, a long short term goal. So I kind of maybe I want to do 50 or gets to that. But like 30 was my goal for last year or the start of this year. 
Sadly, 29, I didn't make it because I had to skip a few uh, Ludendares, but I want to do 50, so that's a short-term goal. I want to work on another BAFTA award-winning game. So Alien Isolation won a BAFTA. That was amazing. The Chinese Room have won BAFTAs as well, and I would like to help the Chinese Room win more BAFTAs. Um, other than that, I just want to continue making amazing games, maybe further down the line, keep making games, and further than that, maybe I want to encourage people even more than I do currently to get into games. I don't know if I want to teach, but I don't know. Maybe. Something down the line. So yes, thank you for your time. So yeah, uh, if you're looking at, um, I don't know how much experience you have in like hiring or designing. I've done, like I did quite a bit of it, Creative Assembly especially. Okay. Uh, so when you look at someone who's applying for a design position, what are the skills you want to demonstrate in their portfolio specifically for design? Um, so is that design like mechanics design yes, or level or design or, or, well yeah, because yeah. so, there are so many different design roles out there, especially like depending on the company. Like someone like Creative Assembly, when they're, you know, like three to 400 people in total, um, the, the roles get very specialized. So you might go on as, I don't know, like a systems designer or a balanced designer, for example. Uh, but then in a bigger company, it would be a much wider, a bigger company, sorry, a smaller company, it'd be a much wider t uh, like range of skills that you need. Like it kind of, I'd say as well, it also depends on the, the, job it's for, like what game you're kind of working on, to whether then you want to be showing like level design within, it could be anything like Unreal, Unity, um, even like 2D stuff like Game Maker or things like that. But then also you'd need to potentially show if, if the role would want you in like doing scripting to be able to show that ability because design roles have kind of shifted more into like an in-between, bet well in my eyes anyway, between design and programming because you need that kind of problem-solving brain to be able to do the scripting side of things. But then also, you can have designers that don't do that, and they're just like literally coming up with ideas and creating mechanics, and maybe I should chat to you like yeah, in a yeah, break. Because, yeah, there's... Well. Oh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, um, I can talk to you about it. Yeah, there's a, a lot of different things that you can show in a portfolio to like help you get noticed, so. Cool, thank you, Cameron. Thank you.